Hi, I'm DC Pearson. I am an author, a comedian, an enthusiastic home cook, and this is Stay for Dinner, a podcast of cooking, curiosity, and conversation. If you love cooking, if you hate cooking, if you don't know how you feel about cooking because you've never tried it before, congratulations, you're in the right place. And the place right now is my literal, actual, kitchen at my house in LA. Um, and my guest for tonight on this tiny dinner party that is also a podcast is going to be the insanely funny, insanely talented Demi Adijawibe. Um, but first, I am going to have to make the food that we're going to be eating, and I'm going to do that right now. Um, I am working with two recipes today. I am working with one called uh, IPA Battered Fish and Chips by Tide and Time on Food 52, uh, which is a website I really like. And then you can't have fish and chips without tartar sauce, I feel like, right? That would be um, heretical, illegal, something. Um, and so I'm gonna be making uh, the tartar sauce recipe of Ina Garten, the Barefoot Contessa. I am not barefoot right now, I am wearing uh, really beat up Pumas, but I will try to channel her <laughs> nonetheless. Um, so yeah, so let's get into it, I feel like. So for the fish and chips, um, we're going to need, this recipe serves four. It's really just going to be me and Demi, um, but I, you know, you never know who's going to show up. So that's not teasing anything. Nobody's actually going to show up. That I know of, but if they do, we'll be set. Uh, so the recipe calls for one pound of cod or other flaky white fish. Got that. I have five large russet potatoes. I have one cup of an IPA. I didn't, I don't understand why it needed to be an IPA for the beer batter, but it just, it hooked me nonetheless because I am a guy with a beard and that is our um, kryptonite. Um, I got a cup and a half of all-purpose flour or a cup and a quarter of all-purpose flour. Um, or as I like to abbreviate it, APF on my shopping lists, because then I feel uh, really cool and chefy. Um, calls for two and a half tablespoons of kosher salt, four cups of warm water, and then vegetable oil for frying. And it just says vegetable oil. It doesn't give an amount. And I'm glad I tested it out earlier in the pot that I'm going to be using, because you need like that's the thing about frying is, is that you always end up needing more oil than uh, you, you think you will. And then for the tartar sauce, I have uh, half a cup of mayonnaise. I got, um, it calls for pickles or cornichons. Uh, in this case, I just have bread and butter pickles. Um, calls for some white wine vinegar, some capers, some coarse grain mustard. Again, our old friend kosher salt, God's chosen salt, and, a, and some freshly ground black pepper. So I am gonna chop us some potatoes first, right? Okay. So it basically says to peel the sides of the potato with a vegetable peeler and leave some skin on the top and bottom. I think that's so you get that like cool looking uh, fry thing where there's like a little bit of potato skin still at the top and bottom. And I am employing a trick that I learned, like a real true cooking hack, like tip and or trick, which is to peel potatoes or any other vegetable, basically, or fruit that you have to peel um, over a cookie sheet, like a baking sheet. And then it just kind of makes it easier for cleanup because you're busy. Um, so I'm peeling these potatoes. It's funny, I was just realizing right now if I was normally doing this, I'd be listening to a podcast. But instead, I am making a podcast. And that is the original Circle of Life. Okay, getting our potato skin off. I feel like I'm in the Navy. Did people really peel potatoes in the Navy as much as is depicted in pop culture? I feel like there's a lot of characters in pop culture that are like, well, when I was peeling potatoes in the Navy. Or is that like, it's also a thing that like authoritarian dads and stuff threaten where they're like, I'm gonna, you're gonna be on a ship peeling potatoes in the Navy. Is that something or am I making that up? That's a, that might be a trope that I'm making up or, or combining. A Franken-trope, if you will. All right, got my potatoes all peeled, and now uh, we are asked by Tide and Time, our recipe writer, to uh, slice these potatoes lengthwise in half an inch slices, then to slice them in quarter inch strips from those slices. So basically we're just gonna cut all down, you know, um, long, long ways, hot dog ways, as they would say in school. Did you guys? you have that in school? I love that. All right, we just have 
huge, just giant, like, log piles of <laughs> sliced potatoes that are going to ultimately become our chips. And we are going to put them in a big old bowl full of water. Let's see. This is four cups of warm water. This we're going to kind of eyeball a little bit, or at least I'm going to kind of eyeball a little bit. for taking two tablespoons of that kosher salt. Oh, let's see, where is my salt pig? Which is the really fun, weird name. It sounds vaguely like a service somebody would advertise on Craigslist in an adults only section. The salt pig is basically just your like little dish of salt that you have in your kitchen so you can quickly grab it and use it with your hands. Although in this case, I did use a tablespoon because I'm trying to be exact. I'm trying to get better about ishing stuff. My wife is really good at it, but it's stirring to combine here, dissolve our salt into the water. Oh yeah, that's gonna be salty as heck. I'm going to start bringing my oil up to temperature here. So it says fill a Dutch oven with vegetable oil so that oil comes a little less than halfway up the pot. So we're going to, um, a Dutch oven is basically like just a big high sided pot with a hilarious name that I'm assuming uh, the, the like dirty joke of was a reference to the pot and not the other way around because otherwise I have no idea what that would mean. Kind of jumping around here, but okay, I'm going to make the tartar sauce real quick before it gets any later and then I can just throw it in the fridge and I won't have to think about it anymore as stuff starts frying up. So Ina calls for half a cup of mayo and then we're gonna cut up some pickles and some capers. And if you get any caper juice in there, that's all to the good. I feel like this is really a meal where every little bit of like acid and tanginess and whatever we're gonna get is the best because we're basically looking at a bunch of big white fried things where the only seasoning really is going to be like salt and pepper otherwise. So a tablespoon of champagne vinegar and Aina in her recipe is saying, hey, let's throw this in a food processor. Um, oh, maybe I should have chopped up the capers, huh? Yeah, I probably should have. This is creativity. This is, this is MacGyver stuff right here. We're just, I'm just mashing them a little bit in a spoon, but I don't feel like getting the blender dirty, so I'm not gonna blend it. I'm just gonna, it's gonna be whole ass capers in here, and that's just something that we're all gonna have to live with, and in my case, love. I really like capers. I don't know how Demi feels about them. We will find out. A um, little bit of coarse mustard. It's funny, just opening up the mayo and then opening up the mustard in quick succession, I feel like kind of already smells like tartar sauce in here. So I do not have cornichon, those tiny like baby pickles that you sometimes see on like a charcuterie spread or something. Um, so we just have some like bread and butter pickles in the fridge. That's what I'm gonna use. And I'm gonna, I'm not, I have not been instructed to by the Barefoot Contessa, but I am going to go ahead and put a little bit of the pickle juice right into the tartar sauce. Because again, any little bit of tanginess, acidity, whatever is gonna be all to the good. My oil is still heating up. I'm being conscious of that. All right, it's getting up there. Kind of in the early 200s. So I'll set my thermometer aside, come back to that oil in a second, and resume chopping my dill pickles. All bread and butter pickle slices. At least, let's go ahead and stir this around and then we'll taste and we'll see if that was a terrible decision. And then ultimately maybe we'll decide, yeah, you know what? Let's throw it in the blender. Hmm. Okay. Here's what we're going to say. Tartar sauce is not exactly where I want it to be. 
it'll bring the, it's bringing the tang. All right, so it says to soak my potatoes for about 15 minutes. I think they've been soaking for 15. So now I'm putting my salt water soaked potatoes onto a baking sheet lined with a paper towel. All right, all done with my salt water. Checking our oil temp again. Okay, so that's gonna maybe take like two more minutes. Um, and in the meantime, let's see here. Oh, I'm going to get out my fish. And it says the cooking time depends on the size of your filet. I think basically the fellow behind the counter at the grocery store gave me, I think basically like two big pieces. And he ultimately, I think it ended up being like a pound and, and change. Oh my gosh, this is all just one filet and it's enormous, wow. Cutting my cod here, it's like a, I don't cook with it very much, but it is, feels like at least what I'm experiencing right now, it's really easy fish to work with. It's already de-skinned and everything, deboned. All right, our oil is up to temperature, so we are going to drop my first batch of chips. Woo! Oh yeah. So my first few are really super duper frying up. Keeping an eye on the clock here. It says fry until edges are starting to brown. I'm gonna take out one and here's where you can use, basically, I feel like a slotted spoon would be good for this. I'm gonna use something called a spider, which I really like the name of. Shout out to Michael Imperioli in uh, Goodfellas. The edges are definitely starting to brown. I feel like my oil was maybe a little too hot. Another round in. It definitely immediately smells like the, we're frying some potatoes. Again, something to keep in mind if you're gonna put in like a big quantity of stuff all at once into oil, your oil temperature is gonna drop, it's gonna change naturally, and then everything's gonna take a little bit longer to cook. So keep that in mind, and in a perfect world, you're gonna probably wanna do them in as small batches as time allows, just cause then you have more control. <laughs> I don't know if you can hear that, but they're like singing as they come out of the fryer. So as it says in the recipe, apparently, and I've heard this before, but I haven't put it into practice very many times, to twice fry your fries is really what gives them the crunch. Okay, I have a little, didn't have a wire rack for a long time. We finally got one and that's fun because that lets the oil drip off onto the cookie sheet and there's a little space so the oil doesn't pool up, which again is another big thing to consider when frying. All right, I think my last batch of fries is probably good to go in terms of twice frying. And the guest is getting here in about 15 minutes. So I guess the lesson is try to give yourself as much time as possible. But that's okay, the fish shouldn't take very long. To fry my fish, I'm gonna be putting the fillets in a bag of flour to lightly coat, and then I'm gonna be dipping them in to the beer batter, and then I'm gonna be bringing them over. So I believe we're gonna be using one cup of all-purpose flour for our beer batter. All right, getting out trusty measuring cup. I am actually gonna measure this. One cup of the IPA or we're about to have our first, what they call in Project Runway, make it work moment, because I think I am realizing that I forgot to grab more all-purpose flour. I have a flour that my wife and I used to make pizza. We're just gonna see how this goes, because <laughs> we don't have time to run to the store and get all-purpose flour. But that's fun, it's gonna be an experiment. If it's really bad, it'll be a story. If it's really good, then I invented pizza fish and chips. Stir it around with a fork, my beer, my flour, my salt to make the batter. And we're gonna place the remainder of our flour in a baggie. I put my fillets in the bag. This might be the kind of thing that I wanna do one at a time. Time's sake, we're gonna do them all at once. Really try to make sure that they get all in the flour. Then 
Fantastique. All right, so this is beer batter turned out really thick. I'm interested to see how that works out. If that's as intended or if that's a byproduct of this different kind of flour we used. All right, here we go. One fish, two fish, three fish, four fish. Ooh, that was really fun actually. I enjoyed that. And I am going to quickly cut us up some lemon slices that are gonna go on the side. Okay, so we're gonna set a timer for about, I should have done it when I put them in, but I didn't. So it says about six or seven minutes. I'm gonna check them in like four because they've already been in there for a minute. All right, so my fish is looking good. I still have like two minutes on my timer that wasn't even my full amount of time. It did say to flip, so I'm gonna try very carefully turning one of them over. Yeah, it's looking good, man. It's looking really good. Um, I'm excited about this. And one thing that's true is they will probably, is true of most things, is that once you take it off the heat, they'll continue to cook a little more, so they might even get a little more brown as they sit there, we'll see. Um, all right, so let's plate up. What the heck, right? Um, oh yeah, I was gonna taste a fry. So I'm gonna taste a fry now. And then it says to serve with malt vinegar, which I do have. Perfect. So I'm gonna bring this stuff over to the table and it's gonna be time to eat. Dude, Demi, welcome. Hello. How's it going? It's going great. Thank you so much for having me here. Thank you for being here. I'm so excited to have you. And tonight we are having uh, fish and chips. Beautiful. With homemade uh, tartar sauce. Ooh, hell And then yeah. malt vinegar is available. Oh, I love it. Um, the foods of my homeland. Is it really? London. Yeah. No shit. Yeah. That's awesome. I say, I, what's I, that? I say that, but it's like, I lived there for like the first four years of my life and then very quickly left. Yeah, but like, if I lived in London for a month, yeah. I feel like I would completely shift over to like Lyft, Lori. Yeah. I would just completely make the switch. So I feel like four, four years, and especially the first four years, I mean, that's a really strong It's easily, claim. it's the thing where I'm like, if I need like a, a interesting fact about me, I'm like, well, this is the, this is the thing. Right. I go to. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just get into it. Let's just start eating. All right. Most of this probably won't be on mic, to be honest with you, because then we're like uh, chewing and swallowing. In the meantime, uh, producer Jessica has selected a random topic for us to discuss while we are making disgusting chewing noises. Ooh. And we're going to discuss that. We're going to eat. And then and uh, we'll be right back with you. So Jessica, if I may have the random discussion topic, please. If you could combine an animal with an element, what Whoa. Would you an animal with an element? What? Wow, okay, great, sweet. Well, let's eat. Oh, okay. And we'll combine animals and elements. Demi, thank you for being here. We just finished our fish and chips with uh, with homemade tartar sauce. Delicious. Um, thank you very much. Yeah, what I, I guess my first question would be like, what was your overall experience of, uh, of the meal? The meal was great. I feel bad because, so before this, I was uh, binging the new season of BoJack, and when like we started, it was like one o'clock, and I was like, great, we'll do lunch, and then I had sushi, and very quickly I was like, oh, I'm not very full. I am very full now, so I won't eat. I was like, great, I'm gonna be not full by the time that we have dinner. And then as I was getting up to leave, I was like, oh no, I feel bloated still, it's been four hours. <laughs> so I got here and I'm like, I will still eat. And then I saw fish and chips and I was like, great, love fish and chips, it will chow right through it. And it was delicious, I truly loved it. I love the tartar sauce especially and like putting the lemon all over the fish and whatnot, but I still like did not finish one of the entire <laughs> fish and I'm like, oh, I feel bad, but do I finish it or do I let it go? I would, re I would rather chat with somebody. I think the less bloated your podcast guest can be, the first rule of podcasting. That is the first rule, yeah. The less bloated the guest can be, the better for everyone. The listener. That's why Santa's never done a podcast. <laughs> you can't find one. Yeah. Um, yeah, well, um, thanks, man. Yeah, it was interesting. I will admit, like, I... So kind of how I landed on fish and chips was we were chatting, you know, when I was trying to get you on. And basically I was just saying like, you know, as I would do if we were at a normal dinner party, like, do you have any dietary restrictions, anything you're trying, you know, right. et cetera. And your answer was like, I'm kind of trying to like 
be, I'm, I'm basically more on the pescatarian yeah. tip at this moment. And you were, I think, very nicely basically like, but I'll kind of, I'm down to kind of eat whatever. It's a special thing, whatever. But I wanted to kind of like meet you halfway. Well, and, and so I, then I just tried to think like, okay, fish, but like fun. Because yeah. I feel like you could also do like, there could have been a something on mustard greens and it's like salmon and that's right. a, a thing. But I also was just like, I don't know. First episode of the podcast, what's like a hooky fish totally. food? Uh, there's a shitty pun there that I didn't need to call out and I'm just hooky? making by calling it out. Um, it. It was truly not my intention, but there we go. No one will believe you. <laughs> <laughs> I think my true fish and chip memories are always of like times that I've gone back to London and been like, ah, that's what they do here. And then I eat it from some like random place in a strip mall or something. But, but it kind of feels like, correct me if I'm wrong, like the... It feels like almost like L.A. in terms of like tacos or sushi or whatever, where yeah. like a strip mall in London, I feel like would probably be the best place to get oh, fish yeah. and chips. Oh, yeah. Still that very good. Right. They got it like in the little paper baskets and they'll be like, you want vinegar? And they'll pour like a ton of it on there. I'm like, great. It all tastes delicious, even though someone will be like, that's not even a good place. I'd be like, where is? And it's like, you got to go to the strip mall. It's like three miles that way. Or right. I feel like there are certain foods and places where if you're eating the food in the municipality that the food is known for, it's going to elevate it yeah. by like easily 20%. Totally. Like even the worst or like most average pizza in New York is probably still pretty good. Right. Yeah. And it's just, I'm looking at the Empire State Building while eating it. Yeah. Therefore... It's seasoning. <laughs> so what were kind of the foods of your childhood or when you, what, what would be that sort of thing for you where you would sort of, if you had a bite of it today, you would sort of have that ratatouille moment? So I, uh, my family's Nigerian and even like in England and when we first moved here and lived in like Irving in Texas just I had so many Nigerian foods like whether it was like my parents or my mom making it or like one of my aunties or something and I think distinctly I remember eating like pounded yam they'd call it fufu but it was essentially it was like literally like pounded yam it looks like mashed potatoes and you eat it with your hand and it's like this very solid cons like sticky consistency and it's they make it with like okra and sometimes chicken and usually like a stew and it's just very Ooh, delicious that's awesome it's I feel like that's hungry. one that I've heard in like some cooking show, I just have a vision of a white lady saying like, I love fufu and yeah. being like, I got to try that. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I've never had it. I don't think I've ever had Nigerian food. So with fufu, are they like, are, are the individual potatoes maintaining their sort of like this? That's one, that's one yam that got squashed or is it like a kind of a larger like mass i think it's more of a larger like it's you can't really tell that one potato has been used or even gotcha. like that it's the same food just because it looks so different from the yam and right it's so versatile in what they make from the yam but i do, do like distinctly remember just my mom essentially making like a big pot of fufu and like of the individual and in, like ingredients and then just being like take some of this so i'm like there must have been like one full yam going into this or like one full whatever. Because I think sometimes you would just use a powder to make it too. But that was one of them. And then I always loved like just jollof rice, which is another uh, Nigerian thing, which is fun because now that I know like a, a lot of like Nigerians in comedy, every time s someone will mention jollof rice, I'm like, oh, we all had this. Okay, great. <laughs> it's just so weird to like grow up being like, well, I'm like the only Nigerian that I know that isn't like a family member or like an extended family acquaintance or something. And so like to sort of leave my hometown and find other Nigerians and have men them mention jollof rice, I'm like, oh, this is weird to like, sort of be like, oh, my childhood is like, it's real. I didn't make it up or something. <laughs> so was there, was there some part of you that like, without questioning it, kind of always thought that either like my family or just Nigerians literally in Irving, this is what they eat? I did kind of think it was like, oh, my family or like, oh, just like, this is like a subsect of Nigerians, but Nigerians specifically that came to like this area of Texas or something because it... it like, even though we'd go to Nigeria sometimes, it always felt like when we went to Nigeria, we'd eat different things entirely. So oh, maybe these were just, like, the foods that my mom was like, this is easy enough to make that I can make it for you guys whenever you're hungry, and it's not, like, a big production. Uh, but, like, if we ever went to, like, a there's a... I don't remember where we were, but we went to, like, a Nigerian restaurant in some city, and I just remember being like, this is very strange for us to do this, considering that we have Nigerian food all the time. But we also didn't eat, like... Uh, pounded yam or jollof rice uh, but yeah I, I guess I just sort of thought of it as like yeah this is the 
this is just one of the things that we eat our family specifically but i guess it's like no a lot, like this is a nigerian food of course other nigerians ate it but just finding out that like elements of your childhood that you always saw as like oh strange or like oh yeah we're not americans like seeing that like reflected in other people when you grow up and meet other people that had like the same cultural background as you is so weird but also like very cool <laughs> right yeah, yeah it's interesting it, um, it, it that must be very like affirming in some mm -hmm. sense to sort of be like, oh, we were all, we were a little bit scattered, but we were all out there yeah. having very parallel experiences. And I would imagine for a lot of those people having similar experiences of being like, people being like, we don't eat that, that's we, or that's yeah. whatever. Um, so was your mom primarily the person cooking in your house growing up? Yeah, it was always her. And like, as my sister and I got older, we sort of took a slow interest in cooking, but not as much as my mom, I'm sure, wanted to. I remember, like, uh, I, when I went to New Zealand uh, this past summer, I was, like, cooking a lot, and I tell my mom, she was like, oh, now you're cooking? And I'm like, <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know what to tell you. Sorry. But, uh, yeah. Do you feel like there's an element of her that's, like, oh, that you were, like, there must be something personal about me that you didn't start cooking until you were on a completely different continent <laughs> from me? <laughs> no, I think she's even just, like, recognizes that it's just... Like, as a kid, you don't want to cook, and you're just like, I can do anything I want. Why would I spend a time making food? That's just sustenance. And, like, as I get older, it's like, oh, there's something very soothing and, like, pleasant about cooking and just finding, like, a, a specific food. I remember uh, the last time my girlfriend was here in town, we went to Little Dom's and got obsessed with the Italian wedding soup. And when I went to visit her in New Zealand, I was just like, we can find a recipe and just make it. So I made it like four times. And that was the thing that I was just like, it's so fun to find a recipe that seems pretty involved, but still be like, I did it. Yeah. And it's just so much more of a joy when you're older than it is when you're a kid and you're like, well, video games are around. Why would I do that? <laughs> right. I do think that is such a like an aspect of like learning to cook, or even if you're not somebody who cooks like all the time, yeah. having it as something that's in your sort of like toolbox of yeah. adulthood is really fun. And the ability to sort of like be eating something at a restaurant and being like, we should make this or just sort of going like, you know what I haven't had in a while is whatever. And the ability then also, I think with just like the internet and stuff to be able to look it up and be like, oh, we can make that. Yeah, I, I can do that. There is a sort of like a cool superpower element to totally. it. Totally. And when your mom was like kind of trying to work you into the cooking process, do you remember, was there any specific task that she was like, or was she just hoping that you would kind of like sit on a stool next to her and be like, she was hoping I would take more. an interest in gotcha. it, but it was always like, I think it was even just kind of like at a certain point I would like see a thing on food network. It was like, you can make a steak in five minutes. And I was like, what? And then it was just, it'd be like very specific things that weren't even like Nigerian cuisine. Just me being like, I can do it very quickly. That's cool. <laughs> even in, this is even in childhood. Yeah. Especially like in childhood specifically. And then as I got older, I had started being like, Oh, what, how can I make these like, intricate foods if I'm willing to take the time or like spend the money or whatever. So what was your like when you had that moment with the Food Network or whatever it is like what was your sort of first like solo flight where you were like I'm going to try to cook something? Well it literally was like a five minute steak where they were just like you can just like heat like sort of put it in the oven between two pans or something like that. I don't remember exactly but I remember just being like, yeah, it works. And now I'm sure if I did it, I'd be like, these are so severely undercooked or like disgusting or whatever. But then I think after that, I'm trying to remember what it was. Cause I, I definitely, I loved baking a lot as a kid. Oh, interesting. Like just like sort of the mechanical process of being like, all right, there's a instructions to follow. And like, I lay out like the pieces of cookies on like a pan and just being like, I made cookies. I just would every so often just kind of make things like that and then just like make a bunch of cookies put them in a bowl and just be like I can't eat them all right now but they're there if anyone wants to eat them but that was always a blast for me was there something that you was there a part of your social world or anything else that that opened up or was it pretty much like just within your family I think it was just within my family uh every so often it would be like Oh, I remember that I used uh cookies to ask someone to homecoming Really? Do yeah. Tell I basically just like made a full tray of cookies and then went to her house and painted like wrote homecoming question mark on them and it was a very awkward thing as everything is when you're like a teenager but yeah I was just kind of like I'm dedicated this is how I'm doing it and it went fine 
She said. She said yes. All right. Congrats, which, awesome. yeah, <laughs> yeah, a real, a real success was there, story. Uh, was there an element of like you went to all the trouble? I'm sure there was because it was not like it was someone who was like kind of a friend of mine, and I was like into them, but we weren't like super close. I think she was even just like, "Why are?" Like I, I remember being like, "Hey, is it cool if I come over?" And she was probably like, "Oh, uh, okay." Yeah, sure, but I don't think she was expecting me. Like, there was nothing in our history that would suggest that I would have done that. So she probably just like, yeah, I don't think anyone else will ask me. Yeah, okay, let's do this. Yeah, I feel like there is that sort of, like, when you're taking those first weird, like, baby deer steps into trying to, like, date or whatever, Mm. there are those weird moments of going, like, I know what I want the moment to be. Mm -hmm. But then when you try to put it into practice, being like, how do I get the pieces, including this person who I don't want to tell them I'm going to ask you to homecoming, yeah. to be in that place for, like, the moment. It's a lot of, like, machinations to sort of just make this idea, like, this is how it works. And then, like, you get there and you're like, oh, there's a lot more talking involved than I expected. And I don't know what to say. <laughs> so I'm just going to be like, uh, uh, I'll read the cookies. And it's like, <laughs> no, that's not how this works. But, okay, like, it's just so... I don't know. I just feel like even just now, I'm just like, ah, oh, God, I wish I could go back in time and just be like, just say, just talk to her normally and don't make a big thing about it. So weird. Was Are we talking every cookie, one letter? Yeah. H-O-M. H-O, yeah. All right. Well, I had to get, I remember it was like, okay, well, I can't just do it on like a square tray. So I got to get one of the trays that's long enough to do it. And it's like, okay, well, to do it that way, I got to make the cookies a little smaller because homecoming is a big word. And <sighs> but then this is all stuff that you're figuring out in advance, though. In advance, but, like, in advance, like, as I'm making the cookies, I'm just kind of like, oh, okay, well, I got to make sure that this is this wide enough. And then, like, it wasn't, like, so in advance that I was planning, like, before I bought the materials or anything. And then there's also a weird element of, like, I'm, I know that this is embarrassing. I don't want my parents to be like, what's this? Or are you asking a girl out? So I'm just kind of, like, making the cookies and then, like, hurriedly going to my car and being like, I'm just, I'll be back in a bit. Like, not telling them what I'm doing. Demi's leaving, and the kitchen smells like sugar cookies. But there are no cookies to be found. Strange. Just Usually mess. he just leaves them in a bowl and says, yeah. if anybody wants these, I'm he sure doesn't even mom. eat them, which makes us suspicious. Yeah. <laughs> my mom was just like, is he laundering, like, eggs or something through the... <laughs> Is that like money laundering, but yeah, for but for, for eggs? Egg. I haven't figured out the mechanics of how this works, but I'm sure my parents did. Ovo lacto fraud? Yes. Is money laundering fraud? I think that's what the laundromat is all about, right? The movie The Laundromat. Yeah. Yes. Meryl Streaming Street. now on Netflix. Absolutely. Yes. This is an ad for the laundromat. <laughs> we got that plug in. I do feel like that is a way to sell cooking or baking to a certain type of person. It's like you're not baking your. Launder or your, ah, you know what you're I mean? Doing, you're doing a fancy crime. Yes, yeah. precisely. Um, yeah, so that, that's, this baking, do you feel like baking is still a big part of your... I still love baking a lot. I, I've made, like, the day before I went to New Zealand, I made a bunch of cookies and then just left. And I remember being like, I made way too many for someone who's going to not eat enough of them to, like, just, I essentially like, left them for my roommate and was like, hey, I made cookies. All right, Bye. Um, but yeah, I love baking still. I, it's just cookies especially are so easy and fun that I, it's a, it's like a fun thing to just kind of play around with. You're like, oh, this is an oven I'm not familiar with. And then you always burn the first batch and you're like, all right, we'll go again. But we're like switching up the ingredients a little bit. Uh, anything like bigger than cookies or like muffins or some small pastry. I'm always just like, I like a cake. I'm always like, nah, that won't work. I won't try. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So is that kind of a new frontier for you or something? I think so. Have you ever, have you ever made a cake? I definitely have once upon a time when I was young. Cause I know that we had like a cake pan or something that I bought being like, I'm going to do it. But I, I don't know if it went successfully or what it was for or whatever, but yeah. So you were passionate enough that you were out there like buying not just like the ingredients, but like gear. Yeah. To make, that's really cool. Like yeah. It's awesome. I feel like what, do you, because it's interesting to me because you were like, my mom did, like, didn't acknowledge that I was cooking until like this year when I was like, right. hey mom, we're cooking a bunch in New Zealand, hoping that she would be like, oh wow, that's really cool. I think it's because a lot of the cooking I did as a kid was like cooking sweet things or like desserts or just stuff like that. And she was like, you ever going to like learn to make, I don't know, like 
the main course. And it's like, mm, no, I'm really into desserts and like making enough that I can eat one and still have so many left over for a month. There is like a weird adulthood versus childhood thing yeah. there. I feel like of somebody being like, well, life's not all desserts. Okay. Like, sure. Sometime, but sometime you're going to tr- need to make the main course. And I, when I get to that point, I will Google the recipe, but for <laughs> now I'm just doing desserts. <laughs> it's not about sustenance. So do you have like a Demi's special cookie? Do you have like a go-to sort of like back pocket? Very basic chocolate chip, nice. uh, but it's like, so there's nothing special about it. Uh, I like them chewy. My girlfriend likes them like crunchy and I'm always like, mm, I'll make half for you, but I'll they're gonna be chew. <laughs> we're yeah. <laughs> we're a two faith household. One of us is chewy. <laughs> one of us is crunchy. We, we make don't. it work. Um, that is. Re- I think like I don't know. I feel like if people if people had to choose like should w- would I be the person who just knows how to cook or would I be the person who just knows how to bake? Yeah. I think baking is so much more intimidating because there is an exactitude yeah. to it. Like it's a little bit. It gets said a lot, but it is really kind of. True, like you do have to kind of like have ratios right yeah. and stuff. Is there some, do you, is there a particular time when you, or like that night before you left for New Zealand, what was like, I'm making these cookies right now? I, it was kind of just me thinking like, oh, there's so much stuff in the fridge that I will like expire by the time I'm back and just being like, God, I really did buy like butter and these things for the express purpose of like making cookies. And I'm like, it, just, it sounds like it'd be fun right now. Let's do it. But I've also just slowly started getting to making like things where it's like, oh, it's the morning. I could make French toast pretty easily right now. Or like my girlfriend likes eggs. I don't, but I'll be like, hey, you want me to make scrambled eggs? And she's like, yeah, but you're not having any. Why? I just like the cooking process. (laughs) And I think it's so much fun because with cooking, you can. I didn't realize until I was older that but so much cooking of like meats and stuff is just like. Put it on the thing, and when it gets hot, it's good. And I'm just kind of like, it's so simple. Why did I not just do this as a kid? You just flip it enough times until you're like, that's good. You cut it open, great. It's cooked through. You did cooking. And you can throw seasonings on there. It's so, like, simple. And now I'm just like, oh, the things I could have done as a kid if I had, like, taken so much more of an interest in just, like, even just stuff outside of it of, like, potatoes or anything like that. It's just, I feel like, damn, I really could have been very into cooking if I had (laughs) cared. Right, but you're here now, and I feel like it's finding you at the right time. Like, it kind of sounds like in a number of the things that you've mentioned, it seems like there's kind of a through line of, like, being in a relationship. Yeah. Is that accurate? Do you find that you're cooking more now, or you're sort of exploring that part of it now? I think I'm cooking more now, being in a relationship, partially because it's like... Cooking is fun and feels like a like a romantic thing to do for someone, but also it feels like something that, like it's kind of upsetting to just order food all the time, or like go out for every meal. Except like when you're on your own, you're just kind of like, whatever, this is just how you can do it. But when you're like with someone, you start to be aware of how much time it is like you spend like ordering in or going out somewhere. And I'm just, sometimes I'm like, uh, it'd be nice to just to be at home and make pasta or something. So I just have a lot of things where I actively try to think about like cooking and not just like ordering out for every meal now, even though it's so much easier. Oh, sure. I mean, I am my, I feel like, (laughs) I feel like a lot of people have this in relationships, but like my wife and I will talk about like, she'll be like, when we started dating, you ordered out so much. Mm. And I didn't say anything because I didn't want to be like weird or like, I mean, Jesus Christ, you're eating out for like every meal. This is like a lot of money or whatever. And It was only after I like got more into cooking and started doing it regularly that I came around to her point of view and like, I used to spend so much money. You know what I mean? Like, I do feel like when you go to like the grocery store and you're, especially if you're like buying stuff for a couple of meals or a nice meal or whatever, it still can get like, especially on where you're shopping, like it can still get like kind of expensive, but I really do feel like there's just a different relationship to it when you're like buying the stuff and making it and then you still have this amount of this thing left over and this amount of this thing so when you go and you read a recipe with eight things in it when you first start your sort of like cooking life i guess or you like literally your pantry you're a little bit like i gotta buy eight things yeah and then once you build up that critical mass of stuff you can like look at a thing and be like oh i only need to buy like the Fish one, yeah. And exactly, like white wine or I whatever. I think that's why I got so into like bacon because I was like, well, I always have eggs and uh, butter. I can do this. <laughs> but 
Yeah. That's, uh, yeah, right, exactly. Like, there is a certain amount of just, like, I usually will have an amount of, like, certain staple things that are, like, my, that I, that I know that I have, and then I just have to be like, oh, I don't have that, and then I don't have that either, but it's kind of like this thing I already have, so yeah. let's just, let's do it. Um, what has been something that you've, what has been, like, a triumph of yours recently that you're like, I can't believe I cooked that? The Italian wedding soup in particular was pretty good at, uh, just because it was truly me Googling Italian wedding soup recipe in a different country and just being like, maybe it can be as good. And like, I just remember having so many ingredients laid out and like taking two hours to make it. And then my girlfriend just being like, wait, this is really good. And just like, sort of like saying it so many times that I was like, no, okay. I get like, she was just like, no, really, I didn't think it'd be this good. And I'm like. Now I feel like it's sincere, but at the same time, I'm just like, did you think I was like incapable of cooking entirely? And she like texts her friend, be like, no, it was really good. And I'm like, what is going on? <laughs> but she said that she loved it a lot. And like, even now that we're back, like we haven't had it from Little Doms again, but I'm like, oh, I could cook it and maybe like take the meat out this time. She's like, it was very good, but I don't know if it'd be the same. And I'm like, okay. But... So she, she kind of, there's some part of her that's going like, that was a moment and a place in time. Yeah. And I'm worried that if you did it the second time around, you would be unable. Well, I did it a few times in New Zealand, uh, but I think it's just she's saying that, like, with the immediate, like, ability to compare it to the Little Dom stuff, she'd probably gotcha. be like, I don't know if it's the same. But Yeah, but then again, I do feel like there's a certain amount of, like, now that's a thing that you guys make. Yeah. And, like, there's the Little Dom's version of it, but then there's also, right. like, your we, version of I'll, it. I'll, like, throw in different things and not spend, like, an hour just making meatballs. Which is what you did the first time. Yeah. So there's something that's, like, hyper-romantic, not even just in the sense of, like, kissing romantic, but, like, capital R, like, romance yeah. about, like, cooking in a foreign country. Did Absolutely. you find it was super different or like when you guys were shopping were there it was it was very intimidating shopping wise uh it didn't help that like the, for some reason the first time i went shop so she was like working throughout the day and we decided to get an airbnb just to like get out of her roommate's space and there was like one day i was just like i'm gonna go to countdown which is their like gro big grocery store and i was just like i'm gonna take a walk over there i'm gonna smoke a little weed and then go for a walk and get in the grocery store and just get all the stuff and of course like Everything's different there. The layout is entirely different. There's not one product that's the same. And I was just so stressed out. I spent like two hours there just looking through the list being like, I don't know where I even fucking find broccoli or whatever. And then just like, I think after that first trip, I was kind of like, okay, it'll be nice to go through there again and like have a sort of familiarity with it. But like, then I just kind of went back and was like in an Airbnb without like a grand view of the city. Like it didn't feel like the romantic sort of way that I would want it to feel. Right. You weren't looking over like the city square yeah. with the man bicycling by with whatever the New Zealand version of a baguette is. Yes. In the... It's still a baguette somehow. <laughs> oh, really? Wow. Yeah. Right on. Uh, but no, I just like, yeah, it didn't feel like I was in a different place because I was so like inside and I guess just like having like all different ingredients was kind of strange and like nice, but I was still like reading the recipes off of like my phone. I was still like just cooking on a... It was like foreign to both of us because it was someone's Airbnb right. that we didn't know. But I, I think over time I did sort of have this thing of like walking through the supermarket and being like, oh, I could make something with this and with this. And it's like, oh, yeah, I guess I could use that as like a sauce and just sort of that sort of very fun like exploration of a supermarket while just sort of being like seeing it as all these ingredients that I can like cook with and being like, oh, what are the spices they have here? Like, oh, OK, I wonder if I can find that back in the U.S., it was very fun. That's cool. So it feels like you were kind of experiencing like what I feel like is sort of like, and I don't even know if I've, I've reached this point yet or, or, or only occasionally touch it, but like that dream of like cooking where you're sort of like, what's good at the market today? I'm yeah. picking up a cantaloupe and I'm sort of like, uh, maybe something with this and a little bit of this. I wish it was more of like just a, like a, a farmer's market like that where I could just be like, hmm, yes, I'll try the spinach today. But it is kind of something like, like, that's not the, like the physicality of it, but I do think that it's like that sort of fun thing of me just being like, I'll just walk down to the market and see what we can get and not have it be like, all right, well, we need to do the grocery shopping now, right. which was very lovely. Do you, do you cook a lot? Yeah, I cook um, pretty frequently. Like we'll usually like maybe make like 
something big for like the week or, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? Like something we can like heat up on a weeknight, especially if we're both going to be really busy. Like one of us will maybe make like a big like pot of something on the week. Uh, yeah. You know, like this week we're literally having like a lentil stew that's like actually really good. And I would not have think I would like just yeah. based off of the words lentil, lentil stew, stew, but it's kind of perfect because before that we were eating something that I made this weekend, which was a like, very indulgent. I think it was like a Otto Lenghi recipe. That's basically like, um, he's this guy, he's an Israeli dude who lives in, I think he's an Israeli English guy and he has a bunch of restaurants in London Uh, and he's a big like cookbook author and he has very, he was kind of made for the Instagram era because Mm. all of his recipes are very sort of like, I'm blending different cultures and influences and tons of like fresh ingredients and like, every other thing is strewn with pomegranate seeds and like it never doesn't look good. Yeah. You know, like it always looks pretty dang good just because yeah. it's like so colorful and cool and kind of interesting. A lot of plant-based stuff. But so this recipe was like not very plant-based. It was a like uh, roasted pork belly with like apples. Mm-hmm. And there was a bunch of different like it was kind of based on like Filipino adobo. So it had like ginger and garlic and these kind of okay. different like flavor profiles that helped kind of cut the fattiness of the pork belly but then again we were literally like i think i made the entire recipe so it like served six we ended up having pork belly like three nights in a row Ooh. and then my wife was like okay we need to like counterbalance this with <laughs> and then we did with something that it feels like you could be past a bowl of at woodstock mm. but was like the perfect counterbalance and is like just like oh great now we have a pot of something in the fridge and we yeah. can just like heat it up when we get home and we don't even have to worry about it um and so i, I think it's kind of like that balance, it's basically, I would say there's kind of like three tiers of it. There's like making something like for the week usually, or for a couple nights of the week. Um, it usually is happening like on a weekend. There's like, I'll often just cause it's fun, like make some kind of like big project thing on the weekend right. that you can then have as like a fun, like Saturday or Sunday night meal. And you're having a bottle of wine and maybe you watch a movie or in our case, like three episodes of real housewives. Yeah. Um, or there's just like, What was I going to say the third tier was? Oh, I feel like, what was it? No, I lost it again. (laughs) Um, Oh, dinner parties. Like we do genuinely have a decent amount. We'll we'll usually have a dinner party like once every like month or a couple of months. And we'll like have people over. And we really like to put like way too much effort into it. That's so dumb. Um, But my wife has always really been good at cooking. It's been something that for me in the past like six, seven years, I've kind of like... I never thought I would like it and never thought I would be good at it. And then one night before my wife got home, I was just like, at the time she was my girlfriend, I was like, wouldn't it be neat if she got home from work and I had like made dinner? Yeah. And so I went and I just like, there was this website that I think still exists called what the fuck do I make for dinner? or What Mm. the fuck should I make for dinner? Which is like, a recipe website, but for Deadpool. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> everything needs something, yes, but exactly. for Deadpool. To right. Sell. It's like that new trend in like self-help books where everything's like, don't fucking yeah. make your neurons you shitty, ass. man. Yeah, yeah, right. Exactly. Which on the one hand is like, I get why that's a thing and it makes everything approachable. I think now maybe it's tipped a little bit into like every book feels like it has yeah. to be like that. But that website was genuinely really cool. You could just click like, and it would just give you a random recipe from somewhere on the mm. internet. So I made this recipe and it had, it was like a seared fish over like succotash. Anyway, it turned out good. And that I am somebody that like really needs things to go well right away. Or I'm like, fuck it. I don't want to do this anyway. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I'm trying to be less that person. But I it's feel like at that time be. in my life, I was like, oh, it went good. She likes it. And so I kind of kept doing it and I really enjoyed it. And I do a little bit still kind of shudder to think like, oh, what would have happened if I had made it and it like didn't go well? Yeah. I like to think I would have kept trying, but there's some part of me that knows like, I think maybe I would have just like given up and not tried again. And so a little bit part of the reason I wanted to do this podcast is because I feel like there maybe are people who've had that experience. It didn't go well. And I kind of want to be like, you can do it. Get back in there. It's been, it's been really great for me. It's truly like my first experience as a grown up having something that I love but I don't in any way do for a living. Yeah. That's, I think that's very important to have, like, especially as you get more and more into like just having the one thing that you do and being like, well, this is just my only thing that I do. And when you're like, well, I need a break from that. It's like, what can you do that you don't feel like you'll be stressed by because you're not good at it or whatever. And I think cooking is so fun because it, it does feel like something that you can get pretty good at if you're just like, if you just all, like all you need is patience. It feels like, like no one has to, like, it's not like a natural, like you just did it. Like, I feel like recipes are so abundant that you can kind of find one that 
will click with you in a, in a good way. Yeah, I do kind of feel like it is a little bit, I try not to take it for granted that it's like, oh, it's kind of a little bit like the golden age of home cooking, yeah. if you want it to be, where it is like you're saying, like you can eat something at a restaurant and be like, I always really like Italian wedding soup when I had it, or this is a really good yeah. one. I can Google it. Again, we're in like, you know, like um, America, there's giant grocery stores with ton, insane Everything. amounts of food. Yeah. Again, it's also like the kind of thing where you think about like, oh, some of this infrastructure, if I really think about it, is probably wasteful and insane, but like it's there for right now. Yeah. So <laughs> let's just enjoy it while, right. <laughs> while we, that's at least one upside of what is in many ways a very crazy society. So like, I do think like right now, if people feel like they want to get into it, it's like, don't wait, like yeah. do it. It's, it can be really cool. And there are so many, like there's a million different like services that are just kind of like, we're just gonna, we want to cut out one level of the food thing. Like just send you the foods and you cook it. And I think that was big for me. Like when I first moved to, I remember like we were doing Gilmore guys, uh, of which you were a lovely multiple time guest. Thank you. Uh, and like one of the, our podcast. sponsors was hello fresh. And so they like would send us boxes. And that was when I was like, Oh, I'm going to have my friends come over and we'll just cook all of the meals at once. And I was like, this is so nice. And it just felt like such a, a fun way to make it communal, but also be like, well, cooking is so fun and you can do it with friends and have it be an activity thing. And that was, I think one way that as an adult, I was just kind of like, I want to do this more, but I don't want to have to wait to like get a food box, like pay for it every week or whatever. And I, I think that like there are mixed like reception on those things in general, just about like how sometimes it makes people like lazier. Or sometimes it's like a thing that we're cutting out that we don't need to cut out. But I do think in general, as like a hobby, it it's very helpful for like just pushing you to try cooking in a, a new way. Yeah, I do kind of think like it's one of those things where it's like I don't you know with those. Cooking services, A, like, this is a podcast about cooking that's going to have sponsors. So there's right. definitely the craven part of me is trying to be like, and all of those are wonderful in their own way. And <laughs> which of you pretty gentlemen wants to take me to the dance? I especially um, love insert here. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, right. Exactly. So in that said, we love because they're so, and it's just, and that's why. Um, no, but, I, but like, no, but I do, I, we cooked one of those like a lot yeah. for a, a couple of years and it was a really good thing. Like right when I was getting into cooking to just be like, you know what? I'm going to like do this. This just like, it shows up again. Like there's different valences in terms of like, is it good? Is it bad? Is it whatever? And it's just like, it's a little bit like everything to be honest with you, where it's like, oh, there's massive upsides to there's uh, potential downsides to it but also it's just like if it gets you in the kitchen it gets you cooking it yeah. doesn't matter what it is because i do think like it can be for so many people such a great like element of their life that they didn't know they could have yeah and for me it's also been in addition to being like a thing that i do but i don't do professionally and i like doing it's also just been a referendum on like can I just sort of do something that's nice or can I have, can I go like, I'm going to have a part of my life that I like and is nice that isn't related to success or yeah. hitting career benchmarks or any of those things that I feel like it's easy to be like, well, I'll have a nice life when X happens. Yeah. And then you, at a certain point you just go like, oh, um, I'm going to die eventually. Right. What if X never happens? I think I will want to have had a nice life. Yeah. You want anyway. to find pleasure in other things outside of just being like getting to a point in your career that is always going to shift anyway. Right. Yeah. So I feel like when, when you were talking about like, even before you were in a relationship, just being a single guy, that it was almost this kind of like communal thing for you or something you were able yeah. to like bring people together around. Were there particular experiences that you had cooking just not even as a, as a person in a relationship, but previous to that, just sort of like for yourself or as a single guy that stick out to you? Definitely for myself a, a few times. Uh, my best friend uh, was once upon a time a chef and is like vegan and has always sort of like preached the benefits of like cooking for yourself, uh, especially because I used to eat out a lot and she, like we would talk about how cooking for yourself is very good just in terms of like the sort of like moral effect of just essentially like saying like you're worth the effort to yourself of like cooking and not just being like, oh, I'll just get something that's easy. It's like, well, no, like you put in the effort, you sort of start to feel a little bit better about yourself and eating and just like the sort of act of like keeping yourself alive. And so I remember one time we had that conversation. I was like, fine, I'll, what if I just cook for like a straight week and see how it goes? And I like that week I was just kind of like, 
it started as me being like, what's the easiest thing to make? All right, pasta, pasta every night. But then it would just be kind of like, I'm sick, of, I'm sick of pasta. What else can I make? And just being like, all right, well, I'll try fish. And it's like, oh, well, what can I do with this fish and the pasta? And it's like, ooh, what can I do with this fish and this pasta? And like, what are these spices I have? And then just like sort of like branching out from there, like eventually just getting excited for dinner and just being like, oh, I'm going to make something crazy tonight. And like even just sort of finding recipes and like getting on Instagram and being like, I made this thing, and like at a certain point, people are like, "Yeah, whatever." Everyone could cook, and I'm like, "Yeah, but I don't usually, so it's exciting for me." <laughs> Did you feel like you got a negative reaction or a sort no. of overt reaction from people? I or? think I think just it's I don't think it's like one of those things that was overt as much as as it is like sort of you imagine like what like what how people are gonna take you down for anything you do, even though sure. it's like people are just generally like, "Oh, that's very nice." No one's like acting like fuck this guy just <laughs> cooking. He thinks he's better than me. It's like no, no. But I think at the same time like you, you get into this mindset of being like if you post anything you gotta know what people are gonna hate about it and so I think for a long time I was just kind of like <laughs> okay I'm posting the food the dinner I made I know it's cliche whatever but I was like like people just say like, oh that looks delicious I'm yeah like, cool great I really didn't I so I've been cooking for like five six years now I didn't start putting pictures of the food online until like this year yeah and it was like a kind of a weirdly big step mm. where I feel like there was some part of me that was going like, okay, I'm making this thing. I know I like it. I think it looks good. Yeah. Maybe I'll text a picture to like my friends or like my brother or my stepmom. But other than that, it's pretty much just me and my wife like eating it and liking it. And yeah. like, that's where the circle ends. And there was a part of that that was like nice, but then I was a little bit just like, I mean, I'm seeing a lot of people posting pictures of food and I feel like I'm making some pretty good food. Yeah. So maybe I'll start doing that. And also I was just like, ah, I like literally got on Instagram like this year. Yeah. Because I'm always just like right, like right, right on, on the, trend. On the downs. Yes, exactly. Yeah. I say buy on the downs, sell on the ups. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> As they say. <laughs> and that's why I'm in the Wall Street remake, Bad Wall Street. Mm, I love it. Thank you. Greed is question mark. Michael uh, Douglas still involved? Uh, <laughs> that's what it says on the poster. You love to see a tagline with a question mark that's right. not like, how far will you go? A it's question mark that's about like... the production of the film. <laughs> Even the marketing department is a little skeptical. Huh. Of. Wow. Oh, okay. I mean, sure, if he wants to. Um, <laughs> but I do feel like that was a weird step. And it's definitely something that I've had to kind of like find my own balance of where yeah. it's like, oh, I feel like I want to put this picture out there because I think this food looks good. And it's just like, fun and then also going like okay but i'm not allowed to refresh it a million times like it's a funny tweet that i had where i'm yeah. trying to like, do people think i'm funny is this funny right. is this the, the tweet that's finally gonna catapult me to yeah you're not big alton Twitter brown's bucks. not gonna see this and be like you got something kid you gotta <laughs> you gotta get you a show right yeah alton brown is gonna slide into my dms and be like um what is he, which he, he's a uh, weird food. No, he's a uh, good eats. He's good eats. And then he's also like, he handcuffs people to the food. What? He has another show. Yeah. He has another cutthroat kitchen. He handcuffs. Yes. What? My brother loves cutthroat kitchen. It's a, he play, he's basically, he's being Alton Brown, but he's being like mischievous and it's basically chopped, but you start with an, everybody starts with an amount of money and then every round he's basically like, okay, you're going to be making whatever in this round. But I'm going to either bring out like you're going to get this ingredient or you're going to be able to take an ingredient from one of your other chefs or like literally weird, crazy stuff like another one of your competitors will be handcuffed uh. to their station and have to like reach out for everything with tongs or whatever. And you bid on those things with your money. Yeah. So basically you're trying to strike a balance between like, is it worth it to screw over the other people versus like, am I going to? still win money at the yeah. end. And the answer is like, yes, you have to. And it's just a race to the bottom, yeah. but it's really fun. It's a little more, it's a little meaner than I like my cooking shows, right. but it's very entertaining sometimes. And as I was watching it with my brother, I was like, I bet you someone's written a paper about like, what is the exact right amount to bid versus like keep your money. Yeah. And sure enough, some little Nate Silver of cooking out there had written a like really hard to understand paper about 538 like, degrees. Yes. exactly. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, oh, all that to say, I do feel like that is, I think if it's the kind of thing where it's like, if that is the thing, again, that's going to get somebody cooking is sort of like, oh, I have something to put on Instagram. Like, do it. Yeah, Great. absolutely. Um, it's been so positive for me in so many ways that I'm a little bit like, yeah, I think that's totally fine. Again, 
And then you have to try to keep it in perspective, which it's a little impossible to do because yeah. it's an algorithm designed to make us feel bad. I'm always like the algorithm stuff is so bad, but I think it, at a certain point I've just gotten to like the fear of getting roasted for anything I do online. So I'm just kind of like, ah, if I post a picture of this food, just think ahead of time what people could make fun of you for and preempt it in a way that they can't do it. And like, that's such a poisonous thing too, where it's like the joy of all social networks is lost. Cause I'm just kind of like, I got to preempt any way that anyone could hurt me like mentally. And then it's just like, well, you're not enjoying this at all. Why are you doing this? Yeah. I think it's sort of going like I am at the end of the day, even if it's about me posting it online, I am still doing it for me. Yeah. And I do feel like there's been things where I made a thing and like the picture doesn't look that good. It only got 30 likes, but I really liked it and I still need to maintain the ability to like Charlie Brown Christmas tree that thing and be like, well, I like it. Yeah. And I also think like there is a we you should just assume I think that anything you post online, somebody is going to be like screen capping and making fun of in like a private thread oh, with their friends. I always forget that. For reason again, and you should. You shouldn't <laughs> think of this actually. I'm taking it back. The rule is not always think that. The rule is never <laughs> think that. Right. Because it probably is happening. So just you gotta, it's not happening in front of you. you yeah. It's just gotta You're gonna be say for fine. reasons. I'm sorry? It's always happening for reasons. Oh, I mean, that people are roasting it? Yeah. Oh, just for whatever. Cause right, it's never. Yeah, yeah, it's it, it, that You can never, like, get away from that. Everything that is put out in the world is going to be somebody's thing that they privately roast with their friends and potentially somebody else's favorite thing or a thing that they love There's and happy. There's an incredible Onion article that I, I think about all the time that's just like embarrassing thing you did in public becomes life bonding moment for a group of teens or something. I'm like, <laughs> mm, ah, just the idea of, yeah. yeah. I, right, I think of like how many people that with them, just the idea of going like, ooh, 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 like the great yeah. smashing lady, the newscaster oh, who like God. fell down is for me and so many other people. Yeah. And that's uh, sad, I suppose. Yep. So have you, has there been any impulse to kind of like marry these two parts of your cooking life and sort of like apply this new passion that you're kind of having to it or this new enthusiasm to stuff that your mom was making that you at the time were like super over? I have still never made any food that my mom has made, but I do feel like the next time I go, like uh, th this last time I went home uh, was to introduce my uh, parents to my girlfriend and they were like, just, it was very fun to just have my mom talk about the food with Maddie. And I feel like the next time I go home, I'm just going to be like, Hey, let's cook some of this food together. Cause I know it would like mean the world to my mom. And I'm sure I'd be like, after that, like, Oh, maybe I can make this food at home or whatever. And it'd just be a fun new thing for the arsenal. But. Yeah. yeah. Is your wife, has your wife had Nigerian food before? Uh, girlfriend, but. I'm oh, like, sorry. Whoa, yeah, slow, whoa, <laughs> oh, I, slow down. I have what's called the transitive theory of getting married. I got married this year. Therefore, everyone got yeah. married this year. Yeah. Uh, no, she never had Nigerian food before. And I, I still am like, like she had like one thing and I'm kind of just like, mm, let's, you had a little bit of it. You haven't had the full gamut of it all yet. <laughs> Cause I'm like, some of it's bad. And I want you to have all the craziest stuff before you're just like, Oh, it's all delicious. What what do you, what, about, like, what specific things are you just like, that's not for me? I don't. There, I mean, I, like, there are some times where we would eat jollof rice as a kid and I was like, this is just too spicy. I don't know why you do it this way. Uh, there was a version of pounded yam that was like gray and not very like, not sweet or like savory that my dad really loved. And I was always just like, I don't get it at all. Uh, they loved snails a lot. Oh, interesting. Which I, I don't think is like super weird. Or I don't think it's as weird as I did when I was a kid, but I still am like, why is that a thing that you're just kind of like all in on? Uh, but yeah. And, and is there a particular, like, are they like poaching snails? Are we like, cause I've only ever really had them barely ever, like maybe once in like a French prepper, like, you yeah. know what I mean? With sort of like drawn butter. I'm or not sure. I feel like it's like snails in some sort of stew. So it's just sort of cooked in a pot, not in any specific way, but I don't know. I think there were a lot of. Uh, foods like that where I was just kind of always like it looks weird I'm not going to try it and therefore I just never had an experience with it but yeah well that's awesome I mean I do feel like there is so I feel like it's one of those things like if you were to go home and like cook this food like her food like with your mom it would be the kind of thing that both of you I feel like would be like I might have regrets that will never that would never yeah. you know what I mean like that's something where I'd be like I will I will never regret that yeah kind of a thing it'd be lovely <laughs> i'm gonna do that thank you for doing this demi i really appreciate it i thank mean like part me. of the reason i wanted to <laughs> part of the reason i wanted to do this show in many ways is kind of like 
because food can be an excuse to just like get to sit and hang yeah. out with people that you rarely see or never see or whatever. And I feel like that's us. I've always really liked you. I think you're super funny and I'm thrilled to have you be here. Thank and uh, thanks for doing this, I man. I feel the I really same way about it. you. I, I remember running into you at like mess hall and just being like, I never see DC. Why am I not better about like reaching out to friends and just be like, oh, you want to, I feel always so like, like I'll reach out to someone and they'll be like, oh, we're not that way. And I'll just be like, no, okay, never mind. Like that's never, <laughs> that's not a thing anyone would reasonably do, but I'm just kind of like, I don't want to, I can't risk it. <laughs> I can't put that on them. No. I can't be like, do you want to hang out and be nice to each other for yeah. a while? Cause then I'm like, no, they're going to screenshot that and be like, this guy wanted to fucking hang out with me and like, can't do it. Oh, I never should have introduced the idea of the secret group text. But the thing is, it's, it's true. <laughs> it's true though. Right. I know. But I feel like our relationship to ourselves and to anxiety is just how much are you thinking about that yeah. and how much does that stop you from doing that you want to doing what you want to do and i wanted to have you on and you were and it was awesome man. thank Thanks you for being here. i, I love really to be here it. all right um all right guys have a good night bye 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 All right, that's it. That is it for this week's episode. Thanks so much to Demi for being here. Couple notes on the recipe. If I had it to do over again, I would have chopped up those capers. They were not blending their best selves in uh, their whole state. Um, and also, if you do decide to make this, a couple of baking sheets will be your friends. Take your time and uh, be careful when frying stuff. That's just a general note. Um, and if you do decide to cook along at home, please tag the podcast. Uh, Hashtag stay for dinner pod just about everywhere. Um, we are at stay for dinner on Twitter. We are at stay for dinner pod on Instagram. I am at D E E C E E Pearson on Instagram because I joined in 2019. And my theme song is July 4th, 2004 by the incredible singer songwriter Jason Anderson. You can find that song, uh, that version of that song um, on Spotify on the EP so long. And my interstitial music was by Advanced Bass, the amazing Owen Ashworth. And I think that's everything. Please rate and subscribe wherever you do that to podcasts. It helps so much. Um, and other than that, I will see you next week. Bye.